Welcome back, everyone. I'm Sunir, President of the Cloud Software Association and CEO of AppBind. I'm here with Mark Brigman from Partnernomics. And, uh, you know, honestly, I invited him on because he, he you emailed, emailed me on LinkedIn. And we had like a really cool conversation. And you're like probably the only person who can nerd out on partnerships as much as I can. And we have the same similar value set. So, you know, I just had to have you on here. Uh, I don't know if people thought that we have come some kind of special arrangement, but it is. This, this time, this SaaS Connect is really about me and my feelings. And I'm, everyone here is entertaining and entertained with us having a conversation. So thank you so much for being here, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Nair. I appreciate the opportunity and um, yeah, look forward to, to sharing some some of the work that we've done, some of the experiences I've had, and hopefully it helps some folks out. <laughs> okay, so let me let me uh, get some table stakes, uh, some housekeeping. First, uh, for those who are participants, uh, this is a pretty open conversation between Mark and I, which means you guys get to participate as well. Please fire Q&A in the Q&A here in the Zoom webinar. Uh, and then Mark will also be around. Uh, I, I twisted his arm to do some masterminds with us in the SAS Connect group. So those of you who aren't SAS Connect level members of the Cloud Software Association, uh, you can go to cloudsoftwareassociation.com slash join and join our Slack group. And then we post the uh, like the member link uh, every so often. And I'll send it to everyone here who can come join and get, uh, we're gonna have more hands-on uh, conversations for people to help you with your uh, businesses in the next couple of weeks, as I know everyone's doing 2021 planning. So with that, uh, Mark, you have a pretty amazing background. Uh, you ran strategic partnerships at Sprint and you have run the largest partnership I've ever heard of, like $5 billion partnership with Ericsson. So t tell us about a little bit about your background uh, at Sprint and then we'll get to how you ended up being doctor partnerships and partnernomics after that, but what, tell me what, what happened at Sprint? How did you end up there? And, and what is this partnership we're talking about? Yeah, so I started my career uh, with the Marines and the Marines gave me an opportunity to learn this world of telecommunications. And then I had the opportunity, one of my business mentors said, go work for the biggest company you can find and don't stay in any one seat for more than 12 months. Go, go build products, go learn marketing, go negotiate contracts, go sell. And then just work your way backwards and figure out what you love. And so in the late 90s, I was just really lucky. I, I went to work at Sprint, the, the largest employer in Kansas City. So I followed uh, my mentor's advice and quickly found this world of strategic partnering, of, of biz dev, whenever biz dev didn't mean sales. Uh, I found this world of biz dev and it was just really lucky and perfect timing for me because the the mobile industry was really just taking off, right? In the late 90s, a cell phone could do two things. You could make a voice call or you could leave a voicemail. And that's about as to the extent of it. And I got to, to join in on a wild ride with Sprint for, for that 13 year period in my career to make cell phones do all the stuff that they do today, at least on Sprint's behalf. You know, so I started my career in tech uh, first in broadcast, but then quickly because it was a dot com in the mobile telephony space. And I remember, <laughs> I remember what it was like all these app stores on the phone, uh, and we're just reminiscing on the in the pre interview here about the old cell phones. People forget what they were like before the iPhone, but these are the deals you were managing, right? These these flip phones, and you have to every app had to go through the carrier and be negotiated with you. So you did those deals, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really uh, funny, quick story is one of the one of my first. I call it my big kid meeting. One of my first meetings, a new app, fresh out of college. Um, there was a product manager that was trying to convince a VP at Sprint that that this thing called texting was was going to take off. And was going to become a thing. And this VP was like, dude, you are crazy. We just spent millions of dollars on this voicemail platform. Why in the hell is somebody going to text, do this triple tap thing that you're talking about? Whenever all I got to do is leave a voicemail. And then fast forward about oh, 10 years or so, maybe not even quite 10 years, I was running all of Sprint TV. Uh, at the time, it was the, the largest mobile television uh, you know, platform in the world. And uh, so I was doing all the biz dev work for that, doing all these deals, putting partnerships together, over 71 of them, putting, putting those together. And I found myself in that same seat trying to convince uh, a VP of product that people are going to watch video on their phones. I promise you, people are going to watch video on their phones. And they're like, Mark, I just don't get it. 
today there's more video consumed on the mobile device than all other devices combined. And so it's it's something to, that we need to keep in mind is, is technology isn't static. I I love that. So I remember I remember uh, I remember because uh, we're in Canada. I'm in Canada, and so SMSs were thirty cents a pop, where they were free in Europe and Japan. And I was trying to convince we were trying to convince because uh, we're building the SVG, like the you know SVG is like uh, vector graphics on the phone, because we believe that you know animations and interfaces would be coming to the phones. And all these some of these in North America people couldn't see it, but if you look at the world, as William Gibson said. The future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed, and just like the the what the what the ecosystem and potential uh, power of the internet is. And so, for the audience here who are trying to wonder, like, what is your relevance to we're a SaaS partnership network? Is like, well, this is the same stuff. Like, we were it was just the generation previous. It was network software, uh, internet connectivity, devices. It's the exact same thing, but the difference is is that SaaS is a tiny industry. Whereas you were working in a ginormous industry. And so everything we are doing and experiencing will eventually hopefully catch up to the levels that you had at, at Sprint. And so, you know, I think, you know, you're kind of, uh, you know, our future for our cohort. And hopefully we can learn from your experiences and mistakes and triumphs. And you had a much bigger uh, experiment to run than when we've been having. Yeah, just whenever we think about the software apps that are on our phone today, you know, they're managed through different app stores. But as we were chatting about earlier, um, whenever the carriers were first starting to launch these quote unquote smartphones, um, the, the carriers had their own um, their own stores. And so bringing all those different applications on board, whether it's a Garmin for turn-by-turn -turn driving directions, it's music, it's games, it's back in the day, right? Screen savers and ringtones and all those things that just come native with our phones now, they used to be in an app store. And so it was, I mean, I was in mobile SaaS before people knew what SaaS meant, <laughs> you know, but but that's what runs our phones. It's, it's all of the software applications. And I had the yeah, I was just in a really lucky spot to be able to work with so many of those different people, but um, so many of those different companies really all over the world, but it was the mobile version of, of SaaS. Okay, so I promise people that, you know, you, you know the difference. <laughs> well, no, who knows? But we know you, you, have, you have a pretty good uh, claim to knowing the difference between a high-performing partnership manager and a low-performing partnership manager. And it comes from two things. One is this $5 billion partnership with Ericsson, which we, let's get into briefly. And then also you did your PhD because you're a crazy person. Uh, I gave up my ma after my master's, like that was enough for me. Uh, but you went ahead, that's good for you. And you're doctor partnerships now. And so you've, you've spent a lot of time, all, you know, talking to like a lot of companies to see what works and doesn't work. And that's the basis of partnernomics. So let's, let's, let's get into it. So let's, what, what, tell us the shape of this Ericsson deal. What was it exactly? Yeah, so to, to give a little bit of history, so in 2005, Sprint had bought Nextel for $35 billion. And the idea was that this, this small to medium-sized business, which Nextel owned, was really a weak point for Sprint. And so Sprint believed, the executives at Sprint believed that, well, let's just go buy it, acquisition. Let's get out the checkbook and let's go buy this segment that we don't have today. And uh, what, what the executives ended up learning over the course of a couple of years is that Sprint's network, not to geek out too much, but Sprint had a, has a, a CDMA network, which is certain a technology type. And Nextel had used an IDEN technology type, and they, they weren't compatible. They're just I didn't different. notice that? <laughs> <laughs> they were different. Oh, we, we can nerd out on that alone. Okay, let's continue. And so, you know, the, the, the gods of network at Sprint at the time believed that they could make them interoperable. And, and I believe over the course of the next few years, they learned that, number one, they couldn't. And number two, that Sprint really, whenever you think about organizations and our various core competencies, Sprint kind of came to the conclusion that, you know what, network management really isn't our core competency. There may be opportunities to partner with somebody where it is their core competency and and let's go that route. And so that's that's kind of the, you know, the build up or how the conversations transpired from uh 05 to to 09. 
And so this, so you ended up outsourcing the network operations to Ericsson, right? Yeah, that that's is right. So it was that's it a was significant was deal. <laughs> taking six thousand employees, actually over six thousand employees that were Sprint employees, Sprint network employees, and now rebadging them to now become Ericsson employees. And so Sprint had uh, formed, it was about 100 people on, on a team, basically a strategic partnering team. Um, I was one of those 100, but I sit kind of in the center of, of all of that. I was on a team called the commercialization team. So we were like the deal people. So we were negotiate, we you know, negotiated the contract, but then all the perpetual amendments and really just being that air traffic controller, keeping all the planes going, you know, keeping all the balls in the air. And it was by far the, the largest deal ever of its kind and uber complex. I mean, I think the base agreement was like some 600 pages and that was just the start. So uh, to quote one of your competitors, the CTO of Verizon at the time, and paraphrase what he's saying, uh, but that is some that is a dumb dumb idea. That's basically what he said. Because uh, it was this is your network, your whole company relies on this, and then you've given up control to another company that you know is only commercially interested for profit, presumably. And you don't have a, like a deeper strategic need, and now your team has to make that chaos work. Is basically what, the truth. So I am terrified hearing this story because it can go wrong a thousand different ways. Did it go wrong? Was it successful? Um, I would say in the end, uh, the general consensus is Sprint decided that it's it's better to pull it in-house, uh, pull it back in-house. And it took over seven years to come to that realization. You know, as you can imagine, a deal that involves over 6,000 people is insanely complex and i mean just a deal between two people can become complex right just imagine what this was like you know over a five billion dollar deal um, that, that involved over six thousand people in the end i guess you know you could say it it wasn't successful or it wasn't maybe the thing to do but on the front end it had all of the the, the capabilities to be successful um, but there's there, there are definitely reasons that it was not successful. Okay, so this is, I, I bring this up, not to throw you under the bus, but this is the key, right, to understanding what was working and was not working our partnership team is that you had this lab of 6,000 uh, dependents on your partnership team and 100 partnership managers. And there was successes and there were failures in this. But you had, through this time, the lights stayed on. I mean, you made it work. Like you, you, your team made it work while the big wigs and the, and, and the CEO, C-suite you know, made the big moves, but you were making it work. And so you had uh, high-performing partnership managers and low-performing partnership managers. What was the difference? I've been building it up all week, Mark, so this has been a yeah, answer. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> I, I hear a drum roll in the background. Um, so let me, let me expand this even further because this is really kind of the impetus of why I went after this world of partnering and and why I'm in the seat that I'm in today. And so all throughout my career, I'm I'm an economist by education, so I'm an efficiency freak. I want to get the most out of every minute and every dollar. And I was I was really lucky to be involved in hundreds of different partnerships where I saw companies just absolutely take off and it made them. We were one of the first to ever do a deal with Pandora. People didn't even know who in the hell Pandora was. And so we had that kind of power to do that. And so I found myself all throughout my 13 year career at Sprint and then even going beyond that doing partnerships, um, you know, just looking at the landscape of partnering professionals and trying to see who is doing this really well and who is not. And why do we have this disparity? And, you know, so that's kind of been a common theme of my analysis in general. And so uh, there's, there's lots of different reasons and, and we'll get into those. But in general, um, the rock stars, they're very intentional about what they're doing and they're, real, they're, they're true students of partnering. They understand partnering 
to a very, very deep level. They truly become students of it. And people that are not successful at partnerships, they, they don't understand what a partnership is. And, and they definitely don't put themselves in their partner's shoes. There's, there's a certain mindset and a certain approach that great partnering leaders take. And in all of the groups that, that I have been in and, and working and leading, you can tell who is and who is going to be a great partnership manager and leader. Okay, there's a couple of things here that require further questioning. What is a partnership? Ridiculous question for a partnership trade association, but I think useful to answer. Yes. So what, what is your definition of partnership and what do you think the ones got it believed? So I, I love that question. And honestly, I mean, I talked to, I can't tell you how many dozens and dozens of partnering senior level leaders all throughout the world every week. And that's one of the first ways I can tell that they understand partnering is by saying time out. How do you define partnering? What does that mean? And that tells me that they're a, a deep level thinker to really understand the whole spectrum of partnerships. Um, so partnerships truly is on a spectrum. And the way that I describe it is on, on one side of the spectrum, you have very transactional partnerships that are more commodity driven, where price is really at the core behind it. So a lot of times that could be sales, that could be procurement, that could be su supply chain management. We, we talk about vendors over here and vendor management. And so for those people, there's not much differentiation. That means it's a commodity. And so it's really about price and it's about really like a service level agreement. Uh, so what is the price going to be? And then how can I transfer as much risk from me onto you and to get you to sign the deal? That's what makes a quote unquote partnership. At Partnernomics, if one of our employees uses the word vendor, it typically makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I, 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 in the world of strategic partnering, I don't like the word vendor, and let me describe why. So on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have the world of strategic partnerships. So what is a strategic partnership? The actual definition is it's a, you know, a relationship between two or more entities where the intent is to create a competitive advantage. Okay, so what does that mean? Competitive advantages allow us, they give us pricing power. Okay, so what does that mean? How do we get pricing power? Well, if we have pricing power, we have the opportunity to have high margins, right? So that's the strategic side. But whenever we have, we need to have differentiation. That's what that's what creates that. That's the reason that we do strategic partnerships. We we have that differentiation. There's only one way to get that. It's the I word. It's innovation, and so. How do we innovate? And really, that's kind of where the, the question starts. How do we innovate? Do we do that in-house organic growth? Do we do it through acquisition? We get the checkbook like Sprint, you know, bought Nextel, or do we do it through partnering and in or a combination of the three? When we decide to do it in partnering, then that's when we have the opportunities to really get this, this multiplier effect. You know, we talk a lot about the mindset of partnering and on the commodity side of partnering, that's kind of this zero sum thinking approach. This is, you know, if, if I give Sunir an additional 10% revenue share, that means it's 10% less for me. You know, so it's zero sum. His gain is comes equally at my loss. And that's that's a very that's the scarcity mentality. If you're playing on the other end of the spectrum, which is the strategic partnering side, it truly is the multiplier effect. It's the abundance mentality of let's work together. Let's create something new and differentiated. Let's grow the market. And then while we're at it, we also grow our own slice of the pie, right? We, we, we get a bigger pie and then we also can get a larger slice while we're at it. And so that's the strategic partnering side. And then you have everything in between. And so you know, so, what, not, so what's the difference then between the high performing and low performing partners in this framework? It sounds like you're like it's in there, but what 
if you had to boil it down, what were the high performing partnership managers doing to adhere to that? And what were the low performing managers not getting? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple different kind of best practices that I would say. And number one is less is more. You know, so generally speaking, I'm going to go down a couple lanes here with you, but less is more. So what, what do you mean by that? A lot of times whenever, especially in channel, or as we're looking at different sales types of partnerships, I mean, we're basically spamming, right? We're, we're wanting to get as many referral partners or even channel partners. We're wanting to get as many partners as possible because that's, that's hooks in the water. We might you know, catch a fish with that. What I have learned over the last 20 plus years of doing this is it's, it's better to have fewer partners that you intentionally and proactively manage and really put energy into as opposed to just hoping and praying. Right. That's a horrible strategy. So it's really about um, being very intentional about who you partner with and having explicit outcomes that you want. Another lane that I'll go down with with your uh, question is. Have a process and, and one of those pieces is to to understand that there's there's a methodology, there's a recipe, there's a process to follow and be very intentional about that. How many times do our executives or we just think, I mean, just, just get the deal signed, just get the deal to the finish line. Getting the deal signed is not the finish line. It's the starting line. Getting a deal signed is the easy part. Not that it's easy, but it's the easy part. Where I see a lot of companies and a lot of clients fail and a lot of partnering managers fail is they don't proactively lead and manage to get the results that they intended out of that partnership. If, it's, if it is not nurtured, if it is not raised, if it is not proactively managed, it, we get in the whirlwind. This world of partnering is kind of the long tail. It's the long-term approach. And that's why I'm not a big fan of people being responsible for sales and partnering is because sales is very short term, very mm -hmm. quota driven, very transactional, very what are you doing today and this week and this month? We really don't look past this month mm -hmm. uh, very many times. But partnering is always that that longer term approach that it, it takes time to build the relationships, to incubate these things, to do the discovery to get the resources, to put them in line and, and start to connect all those dots. If somebody is forming, if, if somebody is wearing both hats, they almost never have time to do the long cycle stuff, the partnering, to do the long cycle stuff well, or to do it right, because it's always the urgent. It's always the transactional side. It's always the sales side that takes the time. So the partnering never, never gets done. I have a you've given me a lot of things I could respond to. Some of it I disagree with and some of it I agree because you, if anyone who knows me for a long time, whenever we said, someone says focus on a few number of partners, that's one of the things that I absolutely disagree with. I think you should go as wide as possible, but that's with a caveat. Uh, so let's so dig into that. Or yeah, let's do it. Actually, and before I should, later. before I forget, these are, these are two of the things you raised is like, how do you even identify the right strategic partner we're actually, you're going deep actually on the 22nd with our members because you're doing a mastermind on going from strategy to execution with a new partner. And then, then how to organize your team again. So you're doing next week, uh, whatever, December 15th, two weeks from now, uh, on how to organize the partnership team's operations as well. So those of us who, who are listening to this and really wish I spent more time digging deep into it, we are. We're spending an hour on each of those topics later this month. Okay, let's go for it. I'm going to... I'm going to give you a hard time. So I'm a fill and kill quantity over quality partnership person. But when I do that, I also uh, have a mandate for my partner team to be the best partner every partner has ever experienced, uh, which is a very hard ask to be the best and best like wide at the same time, wide and deep, uh, which is a really difficult task. And I know, uh, I know it, a lot of people struggle. However, uh, going quality over quantity gives you short-term revenue results, but will wipe you out in the long term with someone who can build a bigger partnership ecosystem. So how do you reconcile the fact that, yes, quality matters for each partner, but you need quantity in order to win? 
Yeah, so let me clarify my answer. If bring on as many partners as you can, bring on as many partners as you can effectively manage. Don't sign deals, set them on a shelf, and pray that they will get results. Because if you're not proactively managing that relationship, they will not get results. Um, I, I couldn't agree more that, I mean, partnering is like any other piece of our business. Let's scale it. Let's keep it going. But it's not about signing a bunch of deals and hoping. It's not it's spraying and praying. It's, it's not about signing a bunch of deals and hoping that they come. It's about being very methodical about who you partner with, why you're partnering with them, and on the front end, getting very clear and aligned on the strategy. One of the pieces, to go back and, and offer another answer to your question, what's the difference between a great partner manager and one that's not? Um, great partner managers really understand what their partner's strategy is. And they find a way to set and layer their own strategy over the top of that path. And they communicate it effectively so that as your partner heads down their natural course of action to execute their strategic plan, they are naturally going to be helping you accomplish yours. So you have that natural alignment. If you see any of our framework, you're going to see the word alignment a lot. That is a piece of it. Um, another piece I'll, I'll drop in there. There's only about 700 pieces I could drop in here, but I'll, I'll toss another one in too. And you have a PhD, so you know I bet you. Have. <laughs> it took a couple years. <laughs> hey, just for the record, um, a PhD doesn't mean you're smart. It means you're too dumb to know when to stop. So I stopped at a master's record. degree, so I will agree with you with that. <laughs> Sunir is much smarter than I am. Just don't my bookshelf up here. It's all the books. It's don't be fooled to, to think that, uh, that that I'm that I'm smarter than Sunir for sure. Um, but a second piece that I'll share with you is it's, it's about the approach and it's about the mindsets and the, the best partner leaders that I've seen are ones who they are legitimately as interested in providing value to the partner as what they expect from their partner. You know, so many times we engage in these, these, conversations to vet out a potential partner. Let's dig into this. Let's dig into this. So Lauren Mason actually asked this question. So uh, it's right on this topic. So how, she asked, how do you offer value and drive abundance value at the strategic level without giving away things in a partnership like discounts, rev share, et cetera, as in, you know, the old giving away commissions and helping people care. People do not care about commissions. They honestly do not. Uh, let me give you a little bit of what I think about this. Uh, cause I've been working, you know, with AppMind, uh, if you remember what it is, so we're helping SaaS companies work, go through the channel. And it's actually been a very interesting year hearing people talk about what they think motivates their partners. And I'm posting an uh, interview every day now I did with marketing agencies about how much they love and hate mostly, uh, software vendors and partners. It's basically though, like, what is the goal from the, from the partner's point of view? Like they do not care about you in the way that you hope they do. You care about your sales and your revenue. They care about their sales and their revenue, right? Uh, and so when you're talking about thinking about the abundance and the innovation, right? It, it, to me, it comes down to who's closest to the customer, understanding your position clearly and understand how you fit into the partner's position to the customer and to help them be a better company to their customer, right? So, um, so tell me, like, I know we had the same conversation when we first met. So like, what, what, are the, what are your partnership managers doing who get this and, are, and how do they structure the conversations around that versus the ones who are like transactional, just focusing, quite frankly, selfishly, inwardly about me rather than we? Yeah. So a couple different things. And, and you bring out a great point. I want to make sure that, that I highlight this because... A lot of people don't get it. You know, a lot of people say, well, we have a partnership with Microsoft. We have a partnership with whoever. It's a strategic partnership. Maybe it's strategic for you, but you are just another number. You are just a vendor at best with those big dogs. So understand that difference. So to dig uh, specifically, a, a lot of times, so like we're talking about channel and referral and these different types of sales partnerships, by their nature, sales is transactional. And so you will frequently find people that partner in this lane 
with a transactional mindset. And, and that's tricky because a very transactional mindset is very different than a highly collaborative uh, mindset. And so first thing that we got to do is we got to understand like what game are we playing? You know, what, what approach is this person taking? It's truly all about having that high emotional intelligence, that high EQ. It's about having a conversation with somebody and understanding what's in it for them. What is their approach? What are they trying to do? What are they personally trying to accomplish? What's their personal strategy and what's their company strategy? Because they're going to be following that. What we need to do is understand what their multi-year strategy is. What are they trying to accomplish and see what can we provide? What value can we provide that is unique that the positions us uniquely of why they would want to connect in deep with us. I just got off uh, another Zoom with one of the largest PRM uh, providers there is, you know, in the in the world, in in our world. And what approach did I take? It's all about understanding, asking a bunch of questions, right? Asking a bunch of questions to understand where are you guys trying to go over the next three years. Then I know all the ways that we can provide value to where they are trying to go. How do PRM make how do PRMs make money? Same way as every other software company. Continually selling those licenses. What hurts those companies? Attrition, people that don't renew. So, is there a way that we could play in that space? Absolutely, let me paint that picture. We have to empathize. We have to put ourselves in our potential partners perspective in their seat and we have to sell we have to sell the idea. We have to sell the vision of how we can help them better than anybody else that they might be talking to. I agree. Uh, the vision, you had, you had a, I saw another one of your talks, uh, but talking about the customer, organizing companies from the customer's perspective, the job to be done perspective. And you're looking at um, Netflix and Blockbuster, for instance, and Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And, and, and I mean, by the way, first people should know when you when you help with people with partnerships, you've had the benefit of working with people across lots of verticals and industries. So you've seen the same patterns emerge over and over again. And it's, you know, just because we're in SaaS doesn't mean that the nature of partnerships changes deeply. Um, and one of the stories you had, which was great, was that uh, Amazon realized that people were in the were in the business of wanting to read a book, not buy a book. And they were, and with Netflix, people want to watch a movie, not rent a movie. Uh, but Blockbuster and Barnes and Noble got stuck in the pattern of selling atoms because that's what they did. And their goals were entirely around selling more and more atoms. But these net network providers were providing experiences, which is really what it's closer to the customer. And so for me, I have this deck, uh, the, the romance of partnerships, where I try to set a big romantic picture of what the deal is uh, and make an indecent proposal. But I always starts with uh, a picture of the winner circle, the future of where, from the customer's point of view, because uh, that usually, you know, I find when I'm doing partnerships that the other partner is doing the same mistakes kind of quite often as your low performing partnership managers are just focusing on quarterly results, right? And you got to remind them, like the, the industry is going to keep moving and the customer is still the customer. And like, how do we, how are we working together? Where is this going over three years? And so like in your, in your operating model, uh, um, like, do you have a plan to, like, do you have a structure, a recommendation to make these conversations more repeatable and more successful? I mean, you have lots of partnership managers, you, you know, you can't just have one, uh, one, uh, one genius doing all the vision and you gotta get everyone to do it. So how do you train people to do this? Yeah. And the the world that one thing that I love about partnering and the, this profession that we're in is it is so comprehensive and it is so complex and I I'm not sure that anyone can ever master it but one of the things that I did you know so I'm five six seven years into my career and I really decided to geek out and yes I kind of went essentially the PhD route doing research into partnership success. It was two pieces. One is, what are all of the imperatives for partnership success? And then number two, if you have this Uber playbook of how to do partnerships, what does that look like? And so I had the ability to cheat uh, just being at Sprint 
we we had deals with essentially all of the Fortune 500s. And so I was able to to reach out to and have interviews, you know, conversations with over well over 100 different executives from all the big dogs, the Googles, the Microsofts, the Oracles, I mean, all of these different companies and ask them, what are the imperatives for partnership success? What does that look like? And it, it boils down to to. It boils down to relationships. We're all human. I mean, companies don't partner with companies. People partner with people, and it's relationship building. And so just real quickly, what are the five imperatives to building great, powerful relationships? Trust, right? We heard about this all the time, and there's been numerous books written on that. Trust. Um, the foundation of all, of all uh, relationships. The, the second imperative, alignment. So it's alignment of vision, mission, core values, and goals. How many times have we heard about partnerships or definitely we've heard about acquisitions? Well, it didn't work out because of a a misalignment of cultures. Really, they're talking about vision, mission, core values, our beliefs, the way that we roll, super important. And what we have to do is we have to build these inside of our organizations first and then we're ready to step outside of our organizations and start to partner. If we're not on the same page internally, there's no way we're going to be any better whenever we step outside of the organization. Real quick, so level, level three, transparency. It's all about communications. And it's interesting, whenever we teach negotiations uh, practices, we talk about being very transparent. It's weird how many times we're really coy and we're really protective and we try to hide you know, what we want. How in the hell is somebody going to know what you want unless you tell them? Lay it out there on the table. So transparency goes really, really far. And there's certain ways that we do that. But communication is, is so critical. Level we have four. A thing, we have a thing we call, say in the C, well, I say in the CSA all the time, that we're trying to stop people to, from doing is partnership poker. Because the other person on the other side of the table is freaking out. Everyone is freaking out in partnership plan because we're all betting our reputations on closing a deal that we have no control over except the other person's emotional maturity on the other side. And we're all freaking out. And if you freak out, you end up getting all tight and playing poker with the other person. And it's this skill of emotional maturity of being transparent and a little bit vulnerable with the other person. Like, I'm also worried about this deal, right? Uh, But let's work on it together. This is just a business case. We can figure it out, right? Totally. And I think the approach and the winning approach and the right approach that great partner managers take is we we call it negotiating from the same side of the table. It's me and you teaming up against this market opportunity. It's not me versus you, but it's me and you versus this market opportunity that's out there. And it's a very different approach to to negotiating. Um and it's fun. It's fun to work through with that because it's a very different mentality than this hostage taker uh, approach to negotiating. Negotiating partnership deals and especially strategic partnering deals, they're done very different from a very different manner than traditional uh, negotiating tactics. Yeah, positional negotiation. Stuff you learn in MBA, well, in the old days, now it's better because getting to yes is now a bigger deal. Uh, is I hate I, whenever I hear someone talk about negotiating skills, and they talk about cents and dollars. I'm like, get out! Like you, you will not understand. Like the dollars between us are going to be less important than the customer dollars to us. That's more dominating than anything we're doing together. Yeah. Um, so level four is more interesting. So what's yeah. level four? Yeah. So level four is where we get into what we call esprit de corps, and so essentially that means commitment but it's commitment like at the highest level and specifically with strategic partnerships, all of them include some flavor of innovation. Innovation by definition means there's not a recipe for it. It's, it's different. It's differentiation. That's what innovation is. And so by definition, we're going to have conflict, you know, by definition, we're trying to weld this, you know, ship as we sail it, you know, as was commonly said. And so expect conflict Another thing I'll say about conflict is conflict itself is not good nor bad. It's, it's how we deal with that. It's, is it constructive and we're challenging each other or is it destructive and we're tearing each other apart? 
And so commitment is absolutely critical to making these strategic partnerships be successful. And it's all the other layers, right? It's the trust, transparency, um, you know, trust, alignment, transparency, and then that helps support esprit de corps. That, that deep commitment of a shared vision of what we're going to accomplish together. It's funny how these all mirror a human relationship, falling in love with somebody, this, getting married. It's, it's a human skills uh, that is so dominating. And it's personally what I love about partnerships, it helps you grow as a person. Like the money's nice and the parties are better and the friendships are great. Uh, but for me, it is like the it is a way of seeing what I can do with this one life that I have. All right, partnerships uh, are the marriage of business. That's right. Partnership is the, is the marriage of business. You know, but, yeah. but Senior, this is a great point. How many times do we just walk down the street and we would say, "Hey, will you marry me?" Because you have a big following, <laughs> because you know how to code, because you understand HR software. You know, but but in business, we do this all the time. Uh, a VP comes in and says, Mark, go do, a, go do a deal with X because they're, you know, one of the market leaders in a certain space. They, ha- they just brought on 10,000 new subscribers last month. Well, shouldn't we understand what their vision is? Shouldn't we understand where they're trying to go? Should we understand what their strategy is? Should we understand what other players are out there in the space that we don't even know about? You know, it's so fun whenever I talk to, to different business leaders about, you know, I, I did an interview um, with Jay Papasan. So he's one of the one of the leaders, one of the senior leaders with Keller Williams. And over a decade ago, they have over, they're the largest, over 180,000 uh, agents now across the world. And they were talking about the next evolution of, of real estate. And they said, you know, let's let's do this exercise and try to figure out who is going to put us out of business. You know, what company is going to put us out of business? And their answer was, it's a tech company. It's not a real estate company. It's a tech company. And that's really interesting to to think about, you know, from a partnering perspective is who who is out there for us to partner with that can cr- help us create a paradigm shift in our business you know i mean who who ultimately put borders out of business it was amazon and it's only it's simply because it it could probably be argued that if it wasn't for borders and their relationship with amazon amazon wouldn't be what it is today because amazon used borders as the cash cow to 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 build their business, to do the Kindle, to to do all of these things. And so we have to be thinking about what is the next step? What is the next evolution? I I love this. So I think we will get into all this stuff deeper on our masterminds, but there's a lot of questions coming in from the audience. And I think we have been fairly high level. So let's, let's see if we can get deep and get some real tactical answers before we run out of time. So, oh man, there's a lot of questions. All right, so, um, number one, uh, Anonymous writes, uh, how, can you expand on partners being responsible for partners, not sales? This is a big problem. A lot of partnership teams are under sales. I think that's the worst idea, personally. Partnerships should be under marketing. Should, uh, should they not be responsible for sales results? Revenues over versus deal signed through their partners. What metrics? This is actually the real thing. How do you measure a partnership's team success? Basically, how do you align the partnership's activities with the rest of the organization, especially the revenue group, which is sales? Yeah. So, getting really clear on what is the intended outcome, right? So, is is it revenue generation, and if so, getting really clear on both sides of what those levels are, and then what it takes to get there. You know, truly, I think managing a channel sales partner, how, why is it any different than managing a sales employee? And what we need to do is equip them with all of the tools, all of the knowledge. We need to equip them for success. And at the end of the day, if they don't hit, if it purely is just the numbers of sales that we're after, we need to ask ourselves, what can we do to, to better 
assist them, educate them, support them, market with them, co-market with them, brand with them to help them sell. Why, why are they not selling? Is, is it because of them or is it because of us? So what are the so like from I agree I mean I can go deep on this so, so what the, what metrics would you use uh, therefore to look at the channel activity apples to apples or apples to oranges with the sales team I think that's the, what the core question is that's a big question in the group like how do you even stitch these, compare these groups to the CFO so what are you supposed to do um so I mean is the question like how you would the common question, the partner team, the channel teams have to be formed. CFO is going to look at the channel partner team sales versus this inside sales team. They need to compare uh, on a metrics level. So what is the answer? Gotcha. Is, is yeah, I thought you were talking about like channel partners versus other channel partners. Yeah, great. So at the end of the day, this, this, the CFO is right in, in, in saying that it's an investment. It's an ROI thing. And so some most companies, right, have they have the in they have the direct sales team. They invest, let's call it a million dollars for X number of people, and they have to drive a certain number of revenue. And then you have another strategy. You're going to go channel, and and those uh, pieces are out there. Those investments are made million dollars, and and do this partnering approach. Um, you know, it is about ROI, right? It is about ROI. So if you have the right partners. If you have the right vetting process, if you are supporting the partners adequately, I can tell you most of the time it's not, but if you're supporting them adequately, the channel should win. The channel should win. And if it's not, something's broke. So what's broke? It could be one of a hundred things. <laughs> you know, what is, what is, what is the process? What are you doing? What are is it because of the partners? Are you choosing the wrong partners? Are we throwing 300 hooks out there just hoping that a fish comes by? There's there's hundreds of reasons that if your channel is underperforming, there's hundreds of reasons why. I think that's that last comment that really answers to the CFO up for reporting the anxiety everyone feels. Is like, would you treat your salespeople as you just hired 100 kids off the street and you said, good luck? you know, without training them or explaining how to sell your product or anything, giving the sales enablement teams. Partners are recruited like 100 people off the street. Here's a phone. Good luck. Uh, don't do that. Right. That's basically uh, what you're saying is, is the story. Horrible approach. Less yeah. is more. Get All as right. many partners as you can, but only get as many as you can manage. You can effectively lead to get results. 100%. Okay. Related question. Seth Sill. There's an anonymous question that's also the same. But Seth still had a more detailed version of this. Often sales leadership, okay, get the same problem because the partnership is often under sales, strongly influences the alliance organization strategy and operating model. How do you balance the short-term growth think thinking uh, and measuring alliances on net new ACV, blah, 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 versus partner source metrics? The goals are aligned at the, at the top brass in his case and, but, uh, and sales leadership. But how do you manage this long-term versus short-term? dynamic so i think the first thing that is super important and not done well is internally within your organizations getting the senior executives all on the same page here's the strategy we have some we have some short-term uh bets that we're placing here's what that looks like here's what success looks like here's what we're doing and here's what success looks like in the short term and then also continually getting on the same page on the long-term side here are some other longer term bets that we're placing and here's what success looks like there and manage them separately a lot of times what happens is we kind of confuse a lot of those and we don't look through the correct lens of what those individual strategies are you know, like so for example like on on the on a sales partnership in that sales partnership lane i kind of think of it in two different two different two different rows one is a referral where it's just I'm getting I'm giving people's finders fees essentially, right? They're just kind of finding these people and they're teeing up an introduction, and then we put them in our process and we take care of them. That's that's kind of a short term, very kind of easy because it's using the bulk of our own internal processes, assuming we have a direct sales process, direct sales team. On the channel side, it can be a lot more complex. 
Right, because on the channel side, by definition, our partner is doing more of those components. Our partner may be doing some implementation, some integration, some training, some of those pieces. Um, but we need to make sure that we segment those and treat them and manage them truly as different strategies, make sure that it's, it's not being blended. And what um, I've noticed is uh, there's a conflict in a lot of the companies I'm talking to where they view they have the inside sales team and they have a go-to market actions for direct sales. And then they try to apply the same approach to the channel. The channel is a different go-to-market strategy because the customer is driving both. The customer decided they don't want to buy direct. They want to buy through a partner for whatever reasons. And you have to align your sale into that. Um, and the, the, it's an interesting difference. For instance, one failure that people do is do the haggle pricing uh, through the channel. And the channel is like, I don't want to do haggle pricing because you are a meaningless component to the sale to me. Like I have other things to spend time on. We're not haggling with you. Just give me a rack rate. Common mistake. It's one example. Um, but if you do, if you will figure a line, realize it's a different go-to-market action, then the, you can start breaking through these barriers. Yeah. Well, so now I want to kind of follow up on that and just share an observation that I've seen over the years. A lot of times, whenever we're talking about standing up a new channel, for example, I can say unequivocally, most senior leaders don't allot or budget for enough time to get the partnership program created and off the ground. Um, most of the time, it takes a minimum of 12 months, I would say 12 to 18 months, to start to get revenues through the channel that's on par with the ROI from the direct sales team. That is one massive mistake that I frequently see. And then the other thing that I'll say, which is pretty general, but it's people launch channel a channel partnering strategy with with no process, with no support, with, with nothing to help manage and facilitate the partnership success. Um, like a PRM, for example, you know, I am surprised at how many people try to tackle a large channel sales program, try to build, launch, manage a, a, a large channel sales program, and they don't have some flavor of a PRM. They don't have any way to manage that. And so the partners are like always in the dark or frequently in the dark. Well, it's all about the, the information management, the data management of that, of facilitating that process all the way through. If your partners don't see that they're going to be benefited, they're going to be compensated, if they don't know what to do or how to do it or how to engage with you, then they won't. They'll go sell something else or they'll go focus on some place that they can make money. By and large, what I've seen through a channel, when a channel partner is not a good partner, is not a performing partner, most of the time it's because they're, they're not managed correctly. We don't give them the support, the information, the tools, the processes that they need to be successful. So, Mark, we got called out by the, by the anonymous <laughs> We're too high level. That's fine. That's why we booked extra time. Uh, so when in these masterminds coming up in the next uh, few weeks, uh, he, Anonymous says these are too we're too academic and you get more tactical, but that's what we're doing, right? You you're, you you have this is part of your course material, right? You have like very specific tasks, uh, tips. Right. Yeah. So I would suggest like we can only do so much in an hour. This is a very big topic, but uh, come join well, us in. Actually, I would love if feel free to. I mean, we can connect. We can we can figure out how to get very specific questions. Um, what I would like to get is give me a scenario. Give me because there's there's thirty different ways that this could be described. Um, the more detail you give me of a scenario, the more detail of an answer that that I can give you. Well, that's actually the whole format of like, to let people know of the masterminds. We just take someone's specific case. Like you tell me what's going on in your company. Uh, because what we all know as partnership people uh, is that we, most of us think it's all, it's only us having the same problem. But if you get, it turns out everyone's having the same problem, but by being concrete, you can share your personal experience and by helping you with your personal experiences, uh, we actually get more deeper answers, but we're all actually have the same problems. That's what we're doing in, in these groups afterwards. Um, so, you know, I would encourage anyone who wants to go deeper into these ideas 
uh, and like more specifically for your use cases to come join us for those uh, uh, in the 15th and the 22nd of December. Um, and we'll email you all about that later. All right, I'm gonna give you one more question because these questions are hot and are amazing before we go. Uh, let's see, can we share the masterminds? If, yes, of course we will. We will email you. Okay, so what basics, you know, how, Gauthier Garnier, and there's a couple anonymous questions. How do you start a partnership team and start recruiting partners? Like what, I'm gonna ask, what are you gonna do in the first 90 days? And this is the last question, so like, High level, like no, sorry, very like step. What is the project plan to get from zero to somewhere in, in one quarter? So starting a, a team itself, like a strategy. I, I assume yeah. they all mean channel in this case, but I could be wrong. But I think they mean channel programs. Yeah, yeah. So really, it starts with number one, um, getting very clear internally, getting very clear inside of your business. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? How are we doing it? And most importantly. How do we define success? What does success look like in six month blocks? What does it look like in six, 12, 18, 24 months? Get to that point super clear with your CEO, your whoever, depending on the size of your organization, get very clear on that. I can tell you 80 to 90% of the time, the, the partnering team leader, and let's call it the CEO, 80 to 90% of the time, that is, is not even accomplished from the beginning. That's where it has to start, is having a very clear strategy of, of what we're trying to do, what we want to do, how we're going to do it, and then and what that looks like. And then um, understanding really, it's we're, we're a huge believer in a SWOT analysis, right? Understanding exactly... What are our strengths? Those are opportunities for us to partner with other companies. What are our weaknesses? What are some areas, some ways that we can improve? Again, that's an opportunity for us to partner with somebody else to help fill in those, those gaps. Get really clear on understanding the difference between must-haves, your needs, and your wants, kind of those nice-to-haves, because those are going to really become into play as we're going out and we're evaluating different potential partners. And then you start the process of going out and we have, we have something we call the five phase partnering process. And a lot of this kind of goes along with that, right? It's kind of building the strategy. What does that look like? There's a minimum of 12 different components to do that. Um, engaging partnering candidates. So how do we go out and find, how do we evaluate, how do we vet those potential partners how do we negotiate deals? How do we bargain? How do we put deals in place that are going to put us up for success? And it's not just kind of the bargaining, the verbal bargaining, but it's also putting a written contract in place. We go through 28 common terms that uh, find their ways into, into partnering deals. And then we have the go, no go decision. Do we close the deal? Um, you know, do, do we execute the agreement or do we not? And when we execute the agreement, now it's time to operationalize it and we put it into our operating system. But most of the time, partnership programs are launched without having a clear strategy or a process or a program or a framework that it will sit on. You're, you're, you can die within your own weight as you go out and you start to find success. A lot of times uh, those sales can come in faster than what the company is even able to process. You can almost kill yourself by having too much success. But it's, you got to build process before the wave comes and understanding what, what that looks like. That's why I'm really, I'm anxious, I'm interested to jump into the next phases of, of our conversations together because that is the detail. That is the how-to. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I wish, I know it's a bit of a tease to everybody, but uh, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> we are we do it we are, that's just we ran out of time and that's where we scheduled extra time but this is uh, valuable time so i posted a couple of links we'll email everyone as well in the chat uh come join the masterminds uh, if you click on that launch pass uh link that gets you into not just this but we're doing we're doing this all year round these kinds of levels of talks at the high level which is the public conversations and going really deep into each other, each person's situation 
because that's we we need like we need smaller groups. Uh, those are on the paid side because we just need to spend more time. So come join us there. But our Slack, you know, our public Slack is free to everyone to who enjoys conversations like this. We're doing this all the time. We help each other out. And with that, Mark, I really appreciate you spending uh, the time with us to go over your experiences and you know reminding us that. Uh, you know, no matter what company or industry or what size and scale of partnerships, like what the core elements are, it really comes down to that human relationship that drives the business results. Uh, as hokey as that is, it is real. And if uh, there is a process to learn how to be more professional and be actually a better human as a result by uh, being a better partnership manager. So thank you so much. Well, Sunir, thank you for the time. And I, I wish I would have... Uh known about or had access to, to your group whenever I started my career because uh, the information that you guys provide is absolutely valuable for, for them. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, we'll post a link to your, uh, your community as well, which is an interesting community because it brings you into other verticals and other strategic partnership managers. Always worthwhile to uh, gain from other people's experiences outside your own. Okay, with that, I bid you adieu. Thank you very much. For more great insights on partnerships and software, like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next video.